Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Retcon. I'd like to thank uh, Frank Munoz and, and the staff and the volunteers. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, we're talking about telling historical fiction through sequential art. Um, by the way, on this chair over here, I have my, my cards and the graphic novel, if you're interested in taking a peek at it. I also have the table back there if you want to talk after the talk. Let's see if this goes up. I, I need to use my hands. All right, anyways. Um, Anyone here? I have two terms, historical fiction, sequential art. Is anyone not too sure what these terms mean? They're kind of big words. Cool. So, yeah, historical fiction basically is telling stories that take place in the past. But usually there's a subgenre for that genre, and that is fantasy and alternative. So we can go back in history and we alter it a little bit to meet a plot. Um, and of course, sequential art, as it seems like we all know, this fancy word for comic book art. And my definition for uh, sequential art, yeah, I'm sorry, my definition for historical fiction is basically it presents unusual facts that come from fantastic reasons. And we'll get more into that as we move along. At the end, we'll have a little time for questions. So make sure if you have, if anything pops up in your mind, write it down so that you don't forget. I'll do my best to answer. For many years, this old painting by uh, Carl Gustav Lindbergh was on display in an 18th century palace in Sweden. Now, as we know, pictures serve a story. And quite often it's a long and complex series of stories. I want to ask in the audience here, what do you think, right, raise your hand, what do you think is, just looking at the picture, what do you think is this man's story? Any, anything, I'm, this is not a trick question. Yes, sir. He's good at chess. He's good at winning at chess. Interesting. Anyone else? Yeah. He's got a wealthy standing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Looks like kind of like a military leader. Right? Right. So, what is unusual about this to you? What is his face. Very serious. A lot of them. Oh, that's that's. He knows something. He knows something. All right. He got a little grin, like he knows something. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. So a lot of everything you all said, except that one that you just said about the smile. I didn't think deep enough about that. Um, I thought these same things as well. A friend of mine named Hussein Abiba showed me his picture and I was fascinated. He gave me not only the picture but the Wikipedia article about this person. This man is named Adolf Ludwig Gustav Frederick Albert Badin. Everybody say that after me. Adolf, Ludwig, Gustav, Gustav. There you go. Frederick, Frederick. You can say it like a Swede. <laughs> Albert Badin. Very good. He was born around 1750 as a slave in the former Danish West Indies, now known as the U.S. Virgin Islands. At around age six, he was adopted by the 18th century Swedish queen, Lovisa Ulrika, a 
and she raised him as one of her own children. Now, just so you know, this is Sweden. This is Italy. So Sweden's way up here. Here's Norway and Finland, Denmark, Poland. Now, back in the 18th century, actually, Sweden included Finland and parts of Norway and parts down here. So it was quite large. It was even larger before then. So from a very young age, this African man had the same privileges granted to her own children and would grow up to become very successful and wealthy, just like many of you observe. He was essentially the first black prince of Sweden. And I will tell you, I'm one of the first in the past 200 years to say that. So it is not without controversy that I state that. So it's fascinating, right? You're looking at this man. I just told you a little bit about him. I said, you know, I got to tell the story. I got to find the story first, and then I got to tell the story about him. So all I needed was a biography, right? A couple other reliable sources, you know, some primary sources, secondary sources, and I'll be set. Well, it's not that easy. Believe it or not, very little exists about this man. There is one known diary written by his hands. It is located in the University of Uppsala in Sweden. Four years ago, I bought high resolution scans of these pages of the diary. And the next year I led a successful Kickstarter to fund the translation. That book, Vadim's Diary, an English translation, is now available free on the internet for anybody. Uh, and it, if you want the hardback, it costs, but it's at cost. And if you want to see it, come to my table, take a look. The diary is not necessarily a tell-all, but it is a peek into his life events. And it's a rather esoteric book, and it has a lot of excruciatingly uh, mundane details that are easy to overlook. But there's a lot of symbolism in the book as well. And being that he was a Freemason, and Freemasons are known for being esoteric, uh, that's probably why. Another source that exists is an historical fiction series of books about the lives of Swedish monarchs that includes moments with Vadim as he worked in various capacities. This set right here is called the Morianen, or the Moor. The author, M.J. Krusenthal, wrote it in the early 19th century after acquiring Badin's entire library from his widow. I only recently was able to get these for myself because the price had come down from $800 to about $100. So uh, the, the Swedish language in it is very old and flowering is very hard to read. I, I, I thought I'd become fluent in the language and I read that and say, wow, man, you got a long way to go. Um, so, oops, I skipped a, uh, okay, so, the other book is Alan Preds, The Past Is Not Dead. This is a brilliantly written English language book it's an expose on Swedish colonialism and institutional racism framed by an incredible amount of fictional and factual details regarding Vadim. Some portions of the Wikipedia article and my own research are sourced heavily from this book and the others. Now, my slide back here, this gentleman is one of my most important sources for my graphic novel. This is Mr. Donald Claiborne. And he spent a couple of years in Sweden. He lived there. And he just got a grant. And he spent two years researching everything he could about Vadim in Denmark and Sweden. And he too was often frustrated by the deliberate erasure of this man's history. And by the way, Mr. Claiborne also served as uh, 
the first postal clerk of African descent in the Swedish post office. And the Swedish post office is a big government organization because that's where people go to get their pension checks as well. So it's kind of like a bank. So what was I to do? Writing something substantial about this man based on historical fact was way out of my reach. And then, frankly, it's out of the reach of everyone until some private collectors decide to give up diaries that they had by him because he did, oh, he, he wrote other things. Uh, we just, we're just going to have a very mysterious jewel in the Swedish monarchy when it comes to Bidenia. To keep, keep in mind that mysterious word. But the personal motivation that I had was growing because the personal motivation to write about him was growing because history had treated him so poorly. And I just wanted to give the man some justice. As I had just returned from a humiliating experience with bigotry in Sweden, where my mixed African heritage and religion were maligned, I could not stop thinking about Vadim. I was reminded that the dark-skinned immigrants of Sweden were often hated and slandered by certain privileged politicians and their followers, how, what they go through. So how could I write a book that could tell a story that would educate the reader, enlighten them, and do so without being a predictable preacher against racism and xenophobia? I mean, I just, I want to tell it like it is, but I don't want it to be boring. Right? Anyone read this book before? Or saw the movie? Raise your hand, movie or the book, whatever. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln, vampire hunter. Right? So I thought about this cleverly written book that my wife, my wife got the, the audio books and she played the whole book in the car when we were on a, on a, on a long trip. So this is a fascinating historical fantasy fiction book that links unanswered aspects of Mr. Lincoln's personal life and causes of the American Civil War to vampires. All of which was revealed in a recently discovered secret diary of the former president. Secret is in quotes. I'm not going to spoil Mr. Smith's story, or my own, but I can promise you, my book is not about vampires. <laughs> this is a panel from the, the graphic novel. So the historical fiction genre seemed to be the best option for a story about Vadim. In fact, the intrigue of his adopted mother, Queen Lovisa Ulrika, has been one of the many interesting characters in Swedish history. We were just talking about that, right? Yeah. And um, this, this woman was actually also born outside of Sweden, in what is called Prussia. Any, anyone know it? I didn't say Russia. I said P Prussia. Anyone ever heard of that place? Yeah. Yeah, so, so Prussia, on my map is gone, was kind of encompassed Poland and Germany. Big area, okay? And her brother was a man who maybe you've heard of, known as Frederick the Great. Great general. Yeah, that was her brother. So, Badin was probably around six years old when he was brought to the queen as a gift. Such gifts were common among the European royalty in the 17th and 18th centuries. And these gifts were often from slaves, you understand? It wasn't like, hey, you know, I'm gonna have some children and I'm gonna give my child to the Swedish queen. You know, it, it, wasn't, it didn't necessarily work out that way. But the queen shook up the royal court. She allowed Badin to have free will. 
and along with all the privileges of her other children. They gave, the historians give Badin a moniker. They say he was the experiment. So Badin, the experiment, is someone who we perceive is being dehumanized, but actually, he really wasn't. I'll keep going. Upon baptism, Badin was given the names of the royal house of Holstein Gotor. And that's that big long name that we recited. That's, when you get that, I will tell you this much. If you're a slave, you're a butler, a servant, you don't get those names. You only get those names if you're a part of the family. He was given also the best education. So the, the royal children, they had the best education in the country in the 18th century. And a lot of people are still illiterate uh, at that time, not anymore. Uh, but uh, ultimately, he turned out to be one of her most trusted allies. When he was an adult and she was dying, she called on him to retrieve her diaries to be burned. Now this is a crucial element to understanding the historical and my fictional body. Now I say my fictional body because many others before me have portrayed their fictional body as a stereotypical sexual deviant and a clown. And when I say sexual deviant, I'm talking some awful things that they accuse him of doing. Uh, one of which is impregnating his adopted sister. All the lies and debunked by Alan Fred. But my body, which I believe is more accurate, is a loving, highly intelligent, and sensitive man who cared deeply for his country and family. That is, in him was a person who the queen loved and admired greatly. Why? Why was his relationship with the queen like it was, and why did she trust him so much? So this is getting the unusual facts, right? This is also from the, the graphic novel. So no one will ever truly know why. That's their secret between Badin and the Queen. However, their secret, like Abraham Lincoln's secret diary that revealed the truth about the Civil War, would be the driving force of my story. This force is the sun around which all events, historical and fictional, will take their orbit. And this is my advice to you. If you want to write historical fiction, find a particular element in history for your story. That is the key. Drink in your main character's uh, uh, secret and make it something that only you know about. And then, tie the historical aspects to that plot as unrelated as they seem, with the strings of fiction. Okay, so you see how you take the history and the fiction, it becomes like a web. And when you write, when you do your outline, you can see it form. So I was committed to a simple plot. Badin had a secret. A secret, she says, must die with me. But it was not just something that the historians alluded to as a temperamental, tyrannical queen's hunger for power, it had to be something that would endanger the future of humanity. <laughs> That's the fiction. <laughs> but it sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> I suppose she just won a lot of power. Yeah, okay. <laughs> she had an affair. Okay. But the future of humanity in the hands of these two? But Badin wasn't just an ordinary man. In fact, he wasn't an ordinary child either. So I had to push myself to make the plot more compelling. Yes, a child. That story would take place when he was 12. 
and it would include his historical playmates and adopted siblings, Princess Sophia Albertina and Crown Prince Gustav III. He would become king of Sweden later and be assassinated. Uh, very famously, you can go to a museum in Stockholm and find the, the gown, the suit he was wearing when he was shot. Woo. But uh, uh, Gustav would be 16 and uh, Sophia would be 9. The historical sources about these two was in abundance. Moreover, many of their experiences would have been shared with Badi. So, can you imagine, you're in a 500 room palace, you're 12 years old, you got free reign. Queen says, leave him alone. I, I'll take care of him. And you got resources that no one else in Sweden has. What would your life be like? Can you imagine? Well, it, it, anybody here, what, as a child, or you got a child, oh, oh he's busy, this is his son. Um, but, but, oh, you're a child? Yeah, you're a child. What, what's your favorite adventure movie? Or book? Book or movie? Any, any, you can think and when you come up with it, raise your hand. Anyone else, what was your favorite adventure movie as a child or book? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes, that was one of mine too. Harry Potter. Yes. Gosh, I thought of that. How about you now? I know you got one now. Goonies. Oh my God. Man, he's watching the retro. You, you and Dad are hanging out. I can tell. That's really good. That's, me and my son, we, we watched Tron. <laughs> Before Legacy. And we watched Legacy after that. But anyways, um, yeah, so the wheels are spinning, right? You're thinking of adventures in the palace, adventures outside the palace, or adventures when you sneak out of the palace. Imagine that. <laughs> All right. Yet, I was still unsatisfied. Sure, Swedish history, forgot about its black prince. But what about an entire people who lived throughout that land before Sweden even existed? Their rich culture and ancient history has been essentially erased from Swedish history books. These people are known as the Sami. These are the indigenous people of that area, which includes Norway, Finland, and parts of Russia. Obviously, they are a big part of the graphic novel because if you've seen the title, it says Badin and the Secret of the Sami. Now, early in the process of brainstorming for the story, I was befriended by a woman of Sami ancestry named Jennifer Harkonnen, and she connected me with contacts, and I did intense research. It's okay, it's all right, it's all right. She did intense research about the Sami people. And I, I did the intense research. She sent me to the people to do it. And immediately, I knew I had to include the Sami. You can't talk about Swedish history and not talk about the Sami people. We're gonna watch this video by Sami artists. It's very short. Sofia Yana and Andrew Suna. And they're gonna explain their struggle through contemporary music and art. I'm hoping it's going to play good here. Yeah. talking about the crimes against the Sami people by the Swedish government. Uh, eugenics. Sweden actually had a lot of scientists that were important to the eugenics uh, movement. That is to purify 
the European ranks. Um, and the Sami being that they're not Europeans, uh, have been victim all the way through the 1970s, actually. Um, so, this is an artist saying, uh, we are still here. And then that's the name of the song. I wish we could hear it. I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> so I put the lyrics. It's really a beautiful song. It says, kill the bison. Sorry. It says, kill the bison, dig out the reindeer's land. Golden iron, blood on green hands. Drown the lava, burn the teepee down. We raise new ones, survivors we are now. Because we are still here, we are still here. We are still here, we are still here. Steal our mother, thieves are not to blame. That's when laws are written by the same. We are still here, we are still here, we are still here, we are still here. So, you can't hear it, right? Yeah. So, don't worry, I did this at the, I'm like, I gotta put this in at the last minute, like at eight in the morning, so. <laughs> but anyways, he's painting on, on this plastic some of the Sami pioneers in Sweden. And in the background are reindeer. The reindeer are very important to the Sami people. This is a this is a sign of their wealth. This is a sign of their this is food, clothing, everything, like the bison, the Native Americans. Okay, the, the, the reindeer are extremely important. So they have had their land uh, 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 taken over by Swedish colonists, and they've been forced to move further and further north. And so she's saying we are still here. Um, can you hear any of that? So that's a yoik. So this is a yoik, where that singing song, where they're actually, actually saying, these are like prayers, connecting with the spirit world, and, and the spirit world connecting with you. Anyways, you can go online and play the video. You'll love it. You'll be like, yeah. You know, you, you, it'll really inspire you. It's really beautiful music. So anyway. So I had a sculpture. It was like a sculpture. The story was, I'm, I'm forming this sculpture, and it's taking shape. The historical fiction story is really taking shape. So I wanted it to also celebrate honor and respect the indigenous people, especially not just the Sami, but of the world. And I wanted Swedes and others to repent for their excesses and not look down upon the indigenous people, nor even speak for them, because they can speak for themselves. Moreover, I want the readers in general to see that the indigenous people are a link to our past and our future. So the plot matured to this. An 18th century adopted son of the Swedish queen and his Sami mentor must save the future of humanity. Now, as Peter David, anyone familiar with Peter David? He's a writer, he writes like comic books. <laughs> But well, he used to write a lot of comic books back in the 80s and 90s. Um, he's really a genius. And he had a book, he has a book called Writing for Comics. He says, all drama is conflict. Badin and the secret of the Sami needed a villain, an engine with which I could crank up the drama. So I have a video here. Of course, the sound is severely compromised. You can read it.
So an antagonist is an archetype, right? I mean, we're all kind of antagonists and protagonists. It depends on what day of the week, <laughs> what happened when we woke up, what happened when we went to bed. But in a story like this, you need someone to represent or to be an amalgam of greed, fear, and bigotry. What perfect man for this would be? But Air Torsten. Like, yeah, scary. But believe me, he's pretty scary. <laughs> he looks like you, right? <laughs> so I had a solid plot. I had protagonists. I had antagonists. This was the beginning. But you may ask, why a graphic novel? Why not a novel? Maybe nonfiction. Well, I am ambitious. Yet I am a practical young man. Young man, right? <laughs> but my time is limited. I have, a I, have, I have this burning desire to reach as many people as possible with the story. So the best way to do that through history and adventure, fantasy and inspiration well, the best way to do that is a motion picture, right? Make a movie. Well, you know, get real, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're not going to do that, Eric. But you could do a graphic novel. You could do that right. Maybe a movie later. Maybe some people, maybe lots of people will buy it. You can take the money and hire a director, whatever. So graphic novel, yeah. I do a Kickstarter, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm on my third now, or something else. Come on to the table and ask me about it. But, um, so a graphic novel is the next best thing to a movie. And, you know, you need a good story, you gotta have a rich background, and you gotta have beautiful composition, right? It's gotta be, it, it, it's gotta be monumental, at least the best you can do. That, that visual composition is very important. So I had to prepare to write a graphic novel. I notice I said write. I said write a graphic novel. That's where it starts. No, don't start drawing the artwork. I got this idea. When you start drawing, I guarantee you, whatever you do, you'll look back and say, this is garbage. I should have wrote the script first. You got to write. Remember, the pictures serve the story. So I took this task very seriously. Writing for comics by Peter David, definitely. That, that's a must read. During lunch breaks and downtime, I would study interviews about comic book writers. I studied comics through my Marvel Unlimited membership. I had graphic novels. I got from Audiac Comics and Skokie and Comics Revolution and Evanston. I went to the library. I got everything I could. So using Microsoft Word and, and then later Scrivener, uh, I spent a few months writing a 10,000 word outline for the story. And in this outline, I tie in all the historical facts and figures with dialogue and narration. Uh, art direction at this point uh, was not as important as writing scenes with flow. So I continued for many weeks revising that outline, and then drafting model sheets for all 25 minor and major characters. So each character has a history and a sketch. And I, I did it for all of them, even the ones that just showed up in two panels. Because I needed to get to know these characters. I had to write about them. The intense research continued. Now keep in mind, while I'm doing all this, I'm, I'm researching too. I'm continuously researching Swedish and Sami history, other world cultures, um, writing and illustrating a, a graphic novel that takes place in the 1700s. You got, it's gotta look genuine and it's gotta be believable. At least, at least 
looking that way and the way people dress and the way people, uh, the way their environment looks. There's no cell phones and stuff back in the 1700s, let alone telephones or electricity. <laughs> so here we go. After many months of writing and rewriting the outline, I was ready to create a full script. Now during this process, between bursts of creativity, I engaged in long, uh, steady sessions of historical research that created a deeper world for my characters. I also felt that if I could not get a literary agent or a publisher to represent me, I would need to market this book myself. Warning, 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 Will Robinson. Warning, warning, all right, you know, Gospel Space Man. Y'all like, whatever, <laughs> let's go, honey. <laughs> this guy's tripping. No, but, uh, you know, if you choose to do a historical fiction graphic novel or any kind of graphic novel, for that matter, uh, be prepared for dozens of rejections and excuses <laughs> about why they can't represent you or publish your book. And be prepared to do the whole project yourself. And, this is not like or, this is and, prepare to suffer the consequences. There will be time. You will sacrifice your family. You will sacrifice your job. You will sacrifice your savings. You will probably go broke. I speak from first-hand experience, okay? But if you believe in it, you're gonna do it anyways. That's why I'm still here. So this realization of possible failure led to the development of a transmedia master plan. That plan included regular Twitter diary entries for the main characters, a video game, and a creation of a four-part prequel to the graphic novel. The prequel consisted of four mini-sagas, that you see here, uh, that would be released every three months leading up to the graphic novel release, which was last May, or was this May. A mini-saga is a very short story of 50 words or less. So you have short stories, you have novels, novella, short stories, and mini-sagas. So uh, my mini-sagas would consist of sequential art of 50 words or less, and I would buttress that with written prologues, epilogues, an appendix with glossary. Just every every pre every mini saga became like a little little uh, workbook, a little textbook, but be fun, fun to read. At least I think it's fun to read. <laughs> so while the rejections uh, increased from my from agents. <laughs> And excuses. I, I had quite a few that said, wow, this is a great story, but uh, I don't know how to represent it. I'm like, okay, y'all want diverse authors. I'm giving you a black sweet and an indigenous man. What do you want? You know, 18th century. I, I guess they just want zombies. Black zombies, I guess. But um, black Swedish zombies. <laughs> So, uh, anyways, forget them. <laughs> um, the, the, the graphic novel became not a graphic novel anymore. It suddenly became a project. And it became a long-term educational, inspirational project. And it became something to vindicate colonized people and portray them through a legendary and dignified lens. So using these mini sagas as part of my transmedia campaign, I wanted to generate interest in the book as well as outline important aspects of uh, important historical events in Europe. And keep in mind, these eggs, these what you see here, this is not the graphic novel. These are just stories of a backstory for the graphic novel. And I wanted to use these to also guide the reader into the graphic novel. And make it more of a more of a comprehensive experience. So from here on, I'm going to share examples of how I link historical events to the plot through fiction. And as I explain these, I want you to think about how, my, how you might link them 
whether it's in my story or your own story. All right. So Varva, this is the genesis of the Badin and the Secret of the Sami Project. And with it, I connect the last ice age, the Sami people, and my own observations of modern Sweden. Some historical facts that I attempt to answer. Why did the last ice age end 10,000 years ago? We think we know, they tell us this is the earth science. Well, I have the reason. Why are the Sami people one of the few indigenous people without a record of warfare or being warrior-like? The invading Europeans just came. The Sami said, look, we're going. Why? This is a question that I begin to answer as the mini Sami. The Traveler, this is the second one. This mini saga moves up the timeline to the 10th century. So that'd be around, 10th century would be around uh, 11, 900. Yeah, I go backwards, right? 18th and 17th, yeah. So it'd be around the 900s AD or CP. And this links two very important characters in the graphic novel. It was wholly inspired by a movie, a historical fiction movie called the 13th Warrior. Anyone see that? Raise your hand. Did you like it? Yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. <laughs> and that movie is based on a real Arab explorer who traveled as far as the area of Western Russia. His documentation, this Arab explorer's documentation is at the root of written history of Viking and Viking-like people. So, like the uh, movie, I send this explorer on a northerly diversion to Sweden. This is before it becomes Sweden. And you know, some of the historical and fictional elements are as follows. Why are the Sami possessors of a secret? Hence my title. How did the Sami survive the earlier colonies in southern Sweden? Conversely, why was their historical presence erased from Swedish history? Now, this question is kind of messed up in here, but this will be raised by someone who read the graphic novel. But why does the antagonist, Air Torsten, feel the way he does about the sun and people? Number three, Kraken. As I quoted Peter David, all drama is conflict. Varva portrays an environmental disaster. Traveler pits a sympathetic explorer against a greedy escort with a curious name. Kraken lifts the curtain a little bit on the antagonist in the graphic novel, Air Torsten. And it exposes a paradox in Swedish history and culture. More historical questions with the threads are as follows. Why was the historical queen, Lomisa Ulrika, disliked by many people and portrayed as hungry for power? How did Sweden go from European superpower to a neutral one focused less on expansion and more on social welfare? And, and Sweden is, uh, in, in Scandinavia in general, is known for that. You, you and me, we, we get a job, right? Maybe, maybe we'll get benefits, right? Health insurance? Well, you go to Sweden, everybody gets it. You get a job, you work. It's not you get a job to get benefits. You work, and then you get benefits because you're a citizen. <laughs> you want to go to college? Okay, go. I don't have no money. You don't need money. Go. The taxpayers. Everybody pays for everybody. The taxes are high. Well, what? Do you, that's what you got to pay for. So Sweden is is known for this, and there are people now trying to change that there because they they want more money. Anyways, what or who spawned the erasure of Sami culture and identity in Sweden? So the, the uh, final one called Mirror, this is the final mini saga. Regardless of the history and the action behind the story, your reader has to relate and sympathize to the main character. So in this final prequel, I feature the graphic novel character by the Now you remember what I said about the heart of the story, of, of this story? That is, why did Queen Lovisa Ulrika trust Badin so much? What was their relationship like? This prequel begins to answer that. 
So, why is Badim so fascinated with biblical scriptures and arcane symbology in his diary? So when you look at my diary, you'll see the symbology and you'll be like, what is this? Why is the historical Badim portrayed as wearing a fez, a crown, or a turban in various portraits of him while he was a member of the royal court? Why did the queen care so much to send the historical Badim to renowned tutors in school? And what are the visual and contextual relationships between this and all the other mini sagas? And how are they connected to the graphic novel? What am I going to do? It's, it seems overwhelming, but when you read it all, when you take it in, you say, ah, I see. So with the mini sagas, the character diaries, and an online trivia game featuring a theme song, I even got a theme song, I have an entire world steeped in lore and mystery. From it, the reader can get a very deep understanding of the graphic novel. Moreover, through such a vast backstory, the readers will also learn a little bit about history and anthropology. And isn't it cool to learn history and anthropology in a fun way? You know? Let's, let's, let's have fun with it. One of the important, uh, one of the uh, really cool things about historical fiction is you can write it about yourself. So imagine you put yourself in the story, right? You're like, hey, Abe Lincoln, vampire, uh, vampire hunter, I'm, I'm your assistant. You can do that. <laughs> so in my case, I wrote about my great, great, great grandmother. During the year of 1762, uh, the year in which the graphic novel takes place, she was about 13 years old. So she is this girl right here in the cover. So I include her, right? She fits right in the timeline. She and her father are important characters in this story. Uh, she also happens to have a Twitter diary uh, that it describes her life as a peasant in Heliford, Sweden. I remember when I first looked at her in, in the proof copy, you know, of my graphic novel, and it kind of brought tears to my eyes. It brought my eyes welled up because, you know, not only was I the first of her American descendants to return to Sweden and rediscover her, but I was the first to tell a story about her. So it's kind of cool, it's kind of fun. So think about that, you know, put yourself in the story too. Or, or, or one of your ancestors, if it's very old. Or one of your descendants, if it's in the future, it'd be a fantasy. So, through her, I answer a few questions about her unusual history. Why did her mother die when she was 12? We don't know. The family history, it doesn't really say. What is the significance of her great, 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 great grandfather and then today in Brezio, Sweden, there's an entire outdoor museum named after him and volunteers portray his arrival from Finland to Sweden in the 1500s. Why? Why is that? Yeah, where's the connection? There's a connection. See what I'm saying? You can take everything that you want and connect it. And you can make it make sense. So again, we have a central theme. We have a plot. I could branch out, connect the historical aspects of the characters, the fictional threads. And the first character seen in the graphic novel is none other than Badin himself. Tying into the plot, I answer many questions as well. Why do historians say he was rude and spoke inappropriately to the monarchs and the nobles? Was it rudeness or was it a perception of rudeness? Why did the historical Badin write some of the passages in his diary the way he did? What are the obscure drawings in the diary about? And why was the historical Badin so fearless and unafraid to speak his mind? Just like in real history, your historical fiction should include women, 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 <laughs> young and old. So this, this little girl right here, Princess Sophia Albertina, is beloved by historians, and she was truly a saint. As an adult, Princess Sophia Albertina created charities for the poor, 
and she pioneered co-education. That means boys and girls can learn together in school. Why? Gustav III, right there, her brother, was said to be uninterested in marrying and seemed to be always at odds with his mother, the queen. Why? That's a big one. <laughs> and Swe Swedes and Swedes and Sweden, like, yeah, he wasn't interested in marrying because he was, wait, you have to read my book. Last but not least, the underlying and recurring character in Badin and the Secret of the Sami is nature. Sweden is officially designated as a Christian nation. But at its heart, it is a very pagan nation, and the culture still is. And when I say pagan, I'm not using it in the pejorative. I'm just saying it in the natural religion, animism, and whatnot. They refer to nature in the definite article. We say nature, yeah, or we'll say mother nature. But in, but in English, we say, yeah, it's nature. But they say nature, the nature, the nature. That is something that they have in common with the Sami people. And, and many elements of folklore are also shared with the indigenous people. In fact, many Swedes, although they may not know it and they may deny it, they are Sami. They have Sami ancestors. And this is due to Sweden's adherence to eugenics and race biology in the past. They're getting over it now. They're not through it, but they're, they're working on it. Many Sami people were forced to deny their original heritage for acceptance in the Sweden. Mining is a really big industry in Sweden. It is so intensive. Check this out. One of the largest cities in the north of Sweden has to be moved. They have to move an entire city because Underneath the city and near the city, they have done so much mining, hollowing out the earth, <laughs> that the city is collapsing. And they are in danger of a serious catastrophe. This, this city is called Karuna. So, doing this, now they're, they're altering the grazing lands and the reindeer. They're altering the water for the fish. And the Sami people again are saying, no, <laughs> you cannot do this to us. But the Swedish government said, well, we have to. You see? So I had to study mining in Sweden in the history, because I had to be accurate. Again, we have concepts of fiction and, and history. Why, if the richest resources are in the north, did the Swedes stick with the central part of the country? Why did the silver mines seem to go out of business, reopen, and shut down again? This is what I found. It was fascinating. Why did 1.3 million Swedes emigrate to America in the 19th and 20th century when the land was so rich with resources? Yet we are told it was not. But why were they caught off guard that so many people had to leave? And why should Swedes take the Sami seriously when they protest against mining and damming of the waters? So here we're at the end. Remember, find the unusual facts and present a fantastic reason for their existence. You need more strings, more connections. This is what you must think of when you're writing your historical fiction graphic novel. Research, research, research. Keep the adventure rolling and remember to make sure you follow a consistent flow from the beginning to the end. So from the mini sagas and the writing all the way to the last page of the graphic novel, I carefully construct a deliberate and easy to navigate maze that leads to an inevitable end. All of which, according to my hopes and prayers, will be the birth of a new folk hero for a new generation. <laughs> so that's uh it's done. <laughs>
I know this was kind of deep. So, whoa, whoa, professor, uh, forgot my notes. <laughs> okay, we have a quiz now. We can pass the quiz. No, just kidding. So, um, I am an artist, okay, but I'm kind of like a nerd about it. And there were 79 original series Star Trek episodes, and you know all of them. But, anyways, um, let's talk. Let's talk about anything on your mind. Any questions? So, historical fiction, has anyone read any historical fiction? Any, any particular one? And, and Berlin, huh, and Berlin, historical fiction, cool. Anyone else? Yeah. You're like, I want to read some historical fiction. <laughs> so, we've been talking for an hour or so. It's like an hour and 15 minutes at the most. Um, but I want to invite you all to, you know, patronize and visit everyone there, including myself. And, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. I, I did bring my full script with me, so I have my thumbnails and my full script, so if you want to look at the anatomy of my graphic novel, it's like, you can see how it formed, you're like, wow. <laughs> um, and uh, I have a uh, last but not least, I'm doing a fundraiser for a book tour in Sweden, so the Museum of Ethnography has sponsored my tickets to Sweden. I just need to raise enough money to stay there for a month. So if I don't raise the money by the end of the day, um, I just go for a week. And I have to raise money for the tickets again another time. But anyways, you can check that out at the table. Sure. So no more, no questions? Yeah, any ask me anything except my password for my PayPal account. Because I don't even know it. <laughs> Yeah, has it ever gotten... Oh, aliens or something? Thanks, thanks. Has it ever gotten to the point where it got too fictional? Aliens and stuff? You know, I... I was... I did scribble in, in my original outline, some real heavy steampunk stuff with some dirigibles because this... this the antagonist has really kind of messed with technology because of what he's done, you have to read the story. So he could go up, think, up 50 to 100 years of technology. And I was like, yeah, maybe that's too much. Dirigibles in the 18th century, big blimps, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, that was, I said enough is enough at that point. Um, no aliens, um, no superheroes. I, when I did tell someone about my book, I said, he, can he save the future of humanity? And he says, oh, is he a superhero? I said, no, he uses his brain. He <laughs> said, oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, ask me anything. It's like, ask me anything. I, mean, I live here as a born in 1973 or something. That's your Bruce Lee guy. It's a hard year. Yeah. So, yeah, well, if you have any questions, feel free to call me or stop by the table. Um, I'm all yours. I'm at your service. I have, I have no secrets. Anything I've done, I've learned it from somebody else. So, and then I put this on, this will be online too. So, thank you.